Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the video that might make you upset, might make you angry, perhaps at me, because I'm going to criticize a lot of liberal ideas that people think are actually conservative. And this is basically the culmination of a great period of frustration that I've had with many different things. So we're going to touch on some political philosophy, or maybe, you know, it invigorates you. Like, whatever the reaction may be, these are things that need to be heard and that need to be discussed. And it really is sort of meant to shock you awake so you can realize the reality of our situation. And it's probably going to go for a while, so watch it in parts if you have to. But keep in mind that everything here is said out of love. I'm not trying to disparage anyone. It's really, it's coming from a good place. I'm just trying to help. And I have to clarify that because I'm probably going to get pretty mad because basically we're touching on where conservatives go wrong, where the country is now and where it's headed if we don't fix it, etc. So please just listen all the way through before you form an opinion on what I'm saying because if you only watch parts of it, you're not really going to get the whole picture, which won't be good because this is important and I doubt that anyone else is going to touch on these things. And quite frankly, I don't feel like listening to anyone on the right talk about how socialism doesn't work, about how Venezuela collapsed because of socialism anymore. Especially because if you were watching the coverage of the riots or if you were there in person like I was, there's little difference. Any difference is basically inconsequential. Like if you change the language on the stores and the clothing and the uniforms, you change the type of cars that were present, you couldn't tell the difference between American cities and Venezuelan cities or Libyan cities or wherever you'd like to point to on the map of the uncivilized world. And conservatives think that the way to stop socialism is to beat it in a debate. We can beat socialism in the marketplace of ideas. And strangely enough, after fascism was defeated in World War II and communism and socialism, or broadly speaking, Marxism, was defeated after the collapse of the USSR beginning throughout the late 1980s and finalizing in 1991, and it's like, that was it, right? We beat Marxism, so why are we still fighting it? Why do we still have to spend so much time and money and energy combating something that was ostensibly crushed on the world stage? Well, it's for a couple reasons. Firstly, the conservative movement in this country has failed to address any of the issues that might compel someone to be a Marxist. Like, if you look at the way this country is set up economically, you have tremendous income inequality. The vast majority of new wealth in this country that is created goes to the top 10, 5, or even 1%. There's nothing inherently wrong with that. People with money invest that money, they get returns on that investment, like, yeah, it's going to work out that way, obviously. But that aside, human nature is not always that rational. Someone in the working class or someone struggling to pay their bills, they see the world's billionaires making almost half a trillion dollars during a global pandemic, during an economic collapse. What's the conservative answer to that? The conservative answer is, well, you shouldn't be upset. It's your fault that you're poor. And speaking very bluntly, there's some truth to that. However, that's not an answer that wins support or that wins votes or that wins elections. Someone can drop out of high school and have kids before they're married. They can make a series of poor choices that lead to them being in poor circumstances. But if your best answer to that is, oh, well, your fault, you're not going to win, especially because your opponent is willing to exploit their grievance for their own political gain by preaching dreams of equality and a completely egalitarian utopia. And that's not to say that conservatives should become Marxists. It's just to say that much of what is considered to be modern conservative thought assumes the perfectibility of the individual and of human nature, which is weird because at the same time, conservatism is fundamentally in support of hierarchy, which is basically the antithesis of leftism. And what that means politically is basically that conservatives will acknowledge that everyone is different. We're not the same in intelligence, ambition, aptitude, whatever. And because of those differences, you will never truly be able to achieve something like equality of outcome if what you're prioritizing is equality of opportunity, which is supposed to be what this country is about. And so that creates a hierarchy of people who do very well and people who don't do very well. We'll just use wealth as a general metric for right now. But the problem with that is that conservatives also assume that because the hierarchy is natural and the inexorable results of competition in a free society, that it's just or that it's fair. But what do you think is the cause of those innate differences in people? It's not a matter of individual choice. It's largely a matter of genetics. It's a matter of who your parents were, which is something that you don't get to decide. Your IQ, which is the most accurate figure for predicting an individual's long-term success. It's much more influenced by genetics than it is by your environment. It's much more nature than it is nurture. Same thing with personality traits and behavior, which are very important for success in a competitive world. Those are much more influenced by genetics than they are by environment. And even if you believe that the environment is more influential, let me ask you this. What causes the environment to manifest? The people in it. The parents, right? What determines how they act? Probably genetics, right? Well, no, it's about the environment that they grew up in. And yeah, okay, cry more, Lib. Like, not only do we know that that's not true, the sort of chicken versus egg debate is much more in favor of the genetic explanation than the environmental explanation. And by the way, blank slate theory, it's a liberal idea. Remember that? Remember John Locke's blank slate theory that an individual is born as a blank slate, everything that they know is influenced by the environment? Yeah, that's a liberal idea. John Locke was a liberal. Liberalism also created free market capitalism. Did you know that? So if you're born as a blank slate, you don't automatically have advantages over other people. I guess something like capitalism would make sense because it would allow individuals who are all starting from square one to compete with each other. Makes sense, you know? But the problem that uh, with that, rather, is that if everything is influenced by environment, 
then someone who's born in a poor family will grow up in a poor environment and then they won't have the same opportunities as someone who grew up in a rich environment. And that's not fair, that's privilege. So we need to help out the people who grow up poor. So you can kind of see how this idea has influenced the way that we think about poverty and privilege now. But the truth is that you can never really achieve something like an equal starting point for everyone in society. There can never truly be a square one. And the liberal explanation of that is people have been put into negative environments and then their kids grow up in these negative environments. And it's this never ending cycle that can never be broken unless we throw money at them to raise them from those negative environments. And if you'd like to see what a spectacular failure that has been, you can read up on the utter disaster that has been the war on poverty uh, and welfare spending and the public education system in this country. This idea just assumes that once the cycle of negative environments can be broken, then people can truly reach their square one. So what we find is that even to arrive at something like equality of opportunity would actually have to manipulate the playing field to truly give everyone the same opportunity because you could argue, and they do argue this, that someone who's worse off than someone else doesn't truly have the same opportunity. And what conservatives say is, well, opportunity just means hands off, what can you do? We're not concerned with truly leveling the playing field and bringing everyone up to the same starting line just to see what happens because it's impossible. It is not possible. You cannot conquer nature, and that means that you cannot beat human nature. And if you look at the history of liberalism, it actively sought to do exactly that. Liberalism sought to liberate human beings from all constraints, including those imposed by nature, which is why we had things like the Industrial Revolution. And you can look at that, and you can say, wow, that was so cool, we have so many products now, epic. But that is also the framework of thought that ushered in things like abortion and gender theory, because to truly liberate the individual, to truly achieve that level of absolute autonomy, the individual must be able to fight against the nature of pregnancy, and the nature of biological sex in order to achieve whatever their feelings want. Liberal philosophy is governed by nothing except the divine will of the individual. But the point I'm trying to make is that conservatives acknowledge the role of nature, we acknowledge the differences between people that will never go away, and we acknowledge that the result of that is a hierarchy. But the problem that conservatives have is that we tend to think that the hierarchy can just be ascended by anyone if they basically just work harder. We tend to think that if people work hard enough, then they can become millionaires too. And the only thing separating someone in poverty from becoming Elon Musk is effectively how hard they're willing to work. And it's that sort of mentality that has caused us to become very apathetic towards those on the lower levels of the societal hierarchy. And that's not right. Maybe you were born into a stable household, your parents are incredibly bright, you are incredibly bright, and already you have an incomprehensible advantage over someone born in the opposite circumstances. You have privilege. And this isn't about, oh, white privilege, oh, check your privilege. White privilege doesn't exist. It makes no sense because your race has nothing to do with what we're talking about. White privilege is the idea that white people are more successful because they are white. And America only likes white people, which of course isn't true. Asians are more successful than white people on average, along with many African immigrants to America, particularly from Nigeria, I think. Um, but what I'm getting at is that we are conservatives, which means that we care about America, we want to conserve American society, and we care about our neighbors. The opposite of that is liberalism. Liberalism seeks to isolate the individual to allow them to, to fulfill their subjective desires independent from any cultural, biological, familial, religious, or societal constraints. Liberalism is also, by the way, the reason the country is collapsing. But uh, since we care about our neighbors, we care about our countrymen, we have to understand that the tools for success are largely given to you independently of your will. Think of it like a construction site. You've got all the supplies to build a magnificent house. You were fortunate enough to be given the tools to do so. So you work your ass off, you accomplish something spectacular. That's great. It would have been much easier for you to just sit there on your ass and do nothing, but you chose to use what you had to do something great. That's awesome. Good for you. Let's say you now have got this like 7,500 square foot house and then the guy next door just finishes building like, you know, a little bungalow, maybe two bedrooms at most, because he didn't have the tools that you had. The supplies were there, but he didn't have the tools. And so now the problem here is that even though you worked your ass off, you worked hard to build that house, it's not your fault that you were given the tools to do it and he wasn't. Human nature is still prone to envy and jealousy. So your neighbor might start to envy you for having more than he does. And then maybe the homeowners association wants to raise rates on you because they know that you can afford it. So they take the side of your neighbor so that they can get his vote. And pretty soon the whole neighborhood is against you. And you can try to explain to them that it's not your fault that their house isn't as nice as yours, which is true. But you're never going to be able to change human nature. Human beings are jealous. And if you look at what actually predicts crime, it's not poverty. It's inequality. It isn't a bunch of poor people looking at each other thinking like, oh, I want what little you've got. It's people that are poor relative to the people that are rich thinking to themselves, I want what they've got. And that's why when you see people stealing and committing crimes, they often end up purchasing luxury cars and designer clothing to emulate the status of the rich. Does that make it right? Absolutely not. But we can't just tell people to stop being jealous. It doesn't seem to be working. The whole point of what I'm saying is that if you're going to advocate for a system that produces inequality, your answer for when people are upset that they end up on the left side of the bell curve of success can't just be, well, should have worked harder. It's your fault. And if you do answer that way, you really shouldn't be surprised when people start to gravitate towards something like Marxism. Is it stupid? 
Yeah, does it work? Literally not once, but you should at least consider that the reason you're in support of something like a competitive system is because it works for you. It allows you to win. And in a way, it also allows those with less to win since they're also getting richer, even if not as quickly as those at the top. And there's also evidence to suggest that increasing the overall wealth of the country lowers crime rates as people reach a higher standard of living relative to the past and to the rest of the world. But the point remains that if conservatives want to win, our message cannot be there are winners and there are losers. And if you're a loser, should have just been a winner. Because it's not that simple. I mean, this isn't even what I wanted to talk about. We've been doing this for like, what, 10 minutes? That message is a losing message. And if you want to lose, that's fine. But understand that if you lose, it means that your guns go away, your speech goes away, and your country goes away. And also that message is incorrect in the first place. The correct message, the true conservative message, is that you are an American. We love you, and we're going to do whatever it takes to facilitate the best quality of life for you and for your family. We're going to put American families first. And the way that we do that is by going after trade and immigration. And not at all coincidentally. Those are the policies that won Donald Trump the 2016 election, trade and immigration. It wasn't because he said socialism sucks. He says that now because he's being advised to say that by people who don't get it. It's because he said we're going to put America first. We're going to have Americanism, not globalism. And his policies address the root cause of something like socialism or Marxism. So if you want to actually defeat Marxism, you have to solve the problems that are causing people to take interest in it. If you don't do that, it doesn't matter how correct you are about anything. You will be outvoted and you will lose. That's reason number one. Remember, we said there was a couple reasons. We're still talking about things like Marxism in 2020. First reason is that conservatives have failed to address problems that compel people to gravitate towards Marxism with an actual answer. And the second reason is that the only leg that American conservatism has to stand on is that the Soviet Union collapsed and Marxism failed and that America and freedom won. That's why we're still talking about this. That's why you cannot go to any conservative event without hearing about Ronald Reagan. 30 years later, we're still talking about this. And the reason for that is that it's the only thing that we can talk about because it's the only thing that the conservative movement has done successfully. We were in a Cold War with the USSR. The USSR collapses. America wins. America wins in 1991. But in 2020, does it really seem like we've won? Are we really that divorced from Marxism and leftism? No, absolutely we're not. The American conservative movement has failed on fiscal policy, monetary policy, foreign policy, social policy, ranging from abortion, marriage, gender identity, to religious freedom, immigration policy. We failed on education policy, gun policy. We have failed on everything. Show me just one substantial and lasting victory in the conservative movement in the last 60 years. I will show you a dozen failures. Why are we so obsessed with Ronald Reagan and communism? Because it's all we have. What else are we going to talk about? I should know. I run a show called Heck Off Commie. What else would I have called it? The Freedom Show? I'm John Doyle. This is a freedom show where we talk about freedom, because that's what we have in America. We have freedom. What does that even mean? What do you mean you have freedom? Do you feel free? How much time every day do you spend on your phone cycling between the same three or four apps, just completely bored out of your mind, but trying to consume any mindless content that you can? Or how many hours every week do you spend watching Netflix? Not because you want to watch a show, because you want to watch something. See the difference? Like you're not sitting down like, oh, I want to watch this specific show. You're sitting down like, I just want to watch anything. So I'll sit down and I'll scroll through Netflix until I find something. And even then you're bored. You feel restless. Or how many times a week do you find yourself watching porn? Not because you're actually like in that mood, but because you're chasing the dopamine that you get from it. Do you want to hear something very important? This is probably the most important thing that you will ever hear about politics. I'm not kidding when I say that. So here it is. Liberalism has lied to you about freedom. Liberalism has tricked the conservative movement into defending its ideas for it, while it progresses into radical leftism. When we think about America, we think of liberty and freedom, but those are not at all the same. And I actually want you to take a few seconds here and just think to yourself about what it means to have liberty and what it means to have freedom. Think about what those mean and think about how those affect you and about how they affect society. And I was actually going to do a separate video just on this that was going to be called The Paradox of American Freedom. And it was going to demonstrate how as we've become more free, we've actually become less free and more like slaves. So I won't get too deep into it right now because I still want to make that video. But basically what I'll say is that the pre-modern understanding of liberty, whether it's in the Greco-Roman tradition with Plato and Aristotle and Cicero, or in the Christian tradition with Augustine or Aquinas or Dante, um, and these traditions are the foundation of Western civilization, by the way. But that understanding was not that an individual is free from all constraints to do as they please. That definition of liberty is very new in world history. That is a liberal definition of liberty. And counterintuitively, it is that understanding of liberty as the individual's ability to do whatever they want without constraint uh, that has led to the downfall of true liberty and of Western civilization. I just ask you to think about what liberty and freedom mean to you 
But when you think about it, why do we regard liberty to be good? Like what is inherently good about an individual having the choice to do as they please? What if they choose to destroy themselves? That's not good. And I know that everyone's thinking right now that I'm talking about like ushering in some sort of authoritarian state because individuals can't be trusted with freedom. That's not what I'm saying. I'm talking about self-governance. I'm talking about people governing themselves and their communities. And what we find is that true liberty is not a condition that we're born into, but rather one that we achieve through discipline. Liberty is not just doing whatever you want, because if you do whatever you want, you will become a slave to your desires because you're a human being and all human beings are flawed. So you'll end up becoming a slave to yourself. The pre-modern understanding of how we now define liberty was basically slavery, where an individual is driven purely by their appetites to a life of misery since the human appetite is infinite and the world's resources are finite. So to like achieve true liberty, you have to educate yourself and you have to have discipline. You have to learn to be a moral person so that you can function in a free society. And that's why liberty is good. Liberty isn't good in itself, but it's good because it requires virtue. Without virtue, it's impossible to achieve true liberty. That is the foundation of Western civilization. But the problem with the true understanding of liberty in the eyes of liberalism was that it required things like tradition and social structures and a defined culture within society in order to cultivate that virtue in people. And since liberalism sought to totally liberate the individual, all of those had to go, along with the true definition of liberty to be, to be replaced by uh, the definition that we go by now. And so what we found out is that when we operate under a liberal definition of liberty, the autonomous individual is achieved. There's no family structure, no common culture or religion or value framework. There's nothing. The only thing that we have in common is that we have nothing in common. And what that does is it destabilizes society. It makes people untrusting of each other. And that leads to a bigger, more invasive government because people seek the stability that they aren't getting in society elsewhere. And so the grand irony of this whole thing is that as we become more free, we actually become less free in the true sense. And that's why when I hear people say things like, oh, America's all about freedom. America's about doing whatever you want. Anyone can come to America and be an American because American culture is an anti-culture. The only thing about American culture is there is no American culture. America is about sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And if you don't like it, you should leave. That's what that whore Brandy Love wrote about in The Federalist. I have no idea how an actual whore got a job writing for The Federalist. But she wrote this article for them talking about what she refers to as sex, drink, and rock and roll conservatives. And she said something like, we like guns and we like God, but we don't like organized religion. And we like to just hang out on the deck drinking beer while listening to rock and roll. And sometimes we use colorful language to describe Nancy Pelosi like really that's conservatism to you sitting on the deck with a porn star drinking beer and calling nancy pelosi a bitch like that's what this is about to you your ideology is whatever facilitates you basically having a barbecue and calling chuck schumer names oh and she also wrote in that article about how only fans is a great thing for society she literally called it like an emotional oasis or something so yeah that's how spineless this type of conservatism is these people don't care about young girls being encouraged to sell their bodies for money but if you come to their barbecue to report a noise complaint Oh, you're going to have a real problem there, you filthy statist. That's all they're trying to conserve. They're trying to conserve drinking beer and swearing. Great. These people just don't get it. Don't you understand that they want you to believe that that's actually conservatism? Why do you think conservatives are losing, even though we're winning elections for the time being? Why has our country shifted so far to the left if we keep voting our guys into office? Because much of what we consider to be conservatism is actually just liberalism. And I was going to do a whole video on this too, so I won't get too into it here, but that's why we're losing. The people that we're sending to fight for us are largely not even conservative. If you think that conservatism is about freedom and liberalism is about control, that's just incorrect. But here's the important part. Liberalism, in theory, orders the society to put emphasis on the individual. And what that does in effect, as we've talked about, is it disintegrates the society and its social fabric, which in turn destabilizes the that society to where we are now, a society where you're free to change genders and kill babies in the womb and smoke weed and watch porn, etc. But in turn, we're also living in a surveillance state in which you need licenses and permits to be a productive member of society. And you can't refuse to bake a gay wedding cake because to do so would infringe upon the ultimate freedom of the gay man to be free even from the disapproval of religion and or society. Do you think it's a coincidence? You think it's a coincidence that it's easier for an 11 year old boy to access hardcore pornography on the internet than it is for him to sell lemonade in his front yard? Do you think that it's a coincidence that in the last few decades, the government has made it much more difficult for young people to pursue things like home ownership and a steady income without extreme debt while simultaneously making it easier for them to obtain things like marijuana? And I'm not going to get into the marijuana debate right now. If you want to smoke it, Go for it. But we're not going to ignore the fact that habitual use of marijuana tends to make people less motivated and less ambitious. What would a generation of young people with motivation and ambition do upon realizing that their country was being taken from them? I don't know. Probably fight back. Well, we can't have that. So let's just make them numb and destroy their natural dopamine levels by getting them hooked on marijuana and porn. That should take care of it. Maybe that's just a coincidence, but the effects are the same regardless. 
But on the other hand, conservatism tends to put eff- emphasis on the family and on the community and on the society. And because ordering things as such allows for the society to be stable, what we find is that that society doesn't need or want a bigger government. And it's capable of self-government because it's filled with moral, virtuous people. That's true conservatism. That's what's required to get the government off your back. And that leads into another question that I want to ask you to think about for a second, which is what significant effect would more freedom have on your life? Conservatives tend to think that the only problems that exist are caused by the governments. And if we only had less government and more freedom, we'd be set. And I don't like government at all. But I recognize that there are huge problems in society that are not caused by government. And we'll get into some of those in just a second. But I have to ask, freedom as a means to what? Freedom is nothing. It's nothing more than a transition into something else. It's like the select screen in Super Smash Bros. Like, okay, you're free. Now what? What do you What do you want to do? What can't you do because you aren't free enough? The only things I can think of would be like owning cooler guns, paying less in taxes, and maybe driving a bit faster and being able to operate a business more efficiently. And this is why I think that this idea of freedom to conservatives in America is basically just a cope. It's a coping mechanism because our society is completely divided. We're more depressed and suicidal and isolated than ever. We're nihilistic. We have no sense of community. We have no family structure, but hot damn, at least we're free. God bless America. Or at least I know I'm free. It's just a cope. You're not free. Freedom has led to the destruction of society. Freedom. Have you watched the news at all this week? Your country was on fire. That's why American conservatives are so fixated on that, because that in opposition to communism is all we have. And we take that freedom for granted, because if you go back 100 years in American society, when it was unified, we had a common culture, a common language, a common religion, and we had a social structure and a sense of community. And not at all coincidentally, the government was much smaller. And so we take freedom for granted in the sense that we don't realize that the way we behave as individuals has consequences for the rest of society. That's the reason our true freedom is disappearing, because people don't realize that the reason you're losing freedom isn't because because the government is getting bigger, but rather the reason the government is getting bigger is because you're losing freedom, because the society is losing its traditional standards of morality and virtue to be replaced by the divine will of the individual, which has destabilized the society and allowed for big government to be ushered in democratically. We basically voted for this to happen over the course of many decades. And the reason for that is what I just said. The reason people used to be freer in this country wasn't because the government was small, but rather the reason the government was small was that the people weren't totally free. They were bound by the standards of the church and the culture. But as that disappeared, so did liberty. And then big government came to take its place. Not only that, but in roughly the same period of time, people decided it would be a good idea, or rather the Democrats decided it would be a good idea to import millions of people from the third world since it helps them win elections. And the people that come in from the third world are coming from collectivist cultures that are much different than ours. Oh, well, what even is American culture? That's my favorite question. One of the greatest tricks of liberalism was to instill a pervasive anti-culture in our country. And after that successfully eroded the true American culture, they have the audacity to ask, well, what even is American culture? And no one has any idea because it's already close to completely dead. The reality of the situation is that these cultures largely do not share our values. And if you'd like to start with a secular framework for American values, you can start with the Constitution. These immigrants are coming in, and by a majority, they're against the First Amendment. They're against the Second Amendment. They overwhelmingly vote for Democrats. And that's why I never quite understood this conservative talking point of, well, I don't like illegal immigration, but I don't mind at all if they come legally. And to me, it's like, if I see a thousand people from Colombia crossing the southern border illegally, what difference does it make politically if they go through customs and the legal process? Like, they're still voting against our Constitution. And illegal immigrants are only a couple elections away from getting a pathway to citizenship, which will allow them to vote. And guess who they're going to vote for? Not us. What we find is that these immigrants aren't actually assimilating to American culture because there is no American culture. That'd be offensive. They're just bringing their culture here. And they're not coming to America because they value our constitution. I'm sure some of them do. But as a general rule, they're coming to this country for the economic opportunity. And sometimes that means exploiting the welfare system in this country, which we know that by a majority, uh, both legal and illegal immigrants do. And trust me, I'm aware of all the economic arguments in favor of immigration. I think those arguments fail to address the net effects of mass immigration on the economy. But I would even go as far as to say the economic arguments are totally irrelevant. Oh, well, John, you don't understand. We actually need to bring in millions of people each year from the third world to help our economy grow. Oh, you mean the economy that's going to be permanently destroyed when they vote the Democrats into power and you can never win an election again? That's that's the one you're talking about, right? That economy, right? The point from this being that 
If the Democrats can successfully import enough voters, they will never have to worry about winning an election again. And the Republican Party will either die or become a much more liberal perversion of itself. And the two-party Overton window in this country will shift to a liberal party and a socialist party. And there's nothing wrong with opposing immigration because it's going to kill your chances of winning elections. Because the whole reason that they're in favor of it in the first place is because it's going to kill our chances of winning elections. And to everyone that's going to call this racist, I don't want the Europeans coming in here trying to take our guns away and nationalize our health care either. It has nothing to do with race. Everything to do with culture. I'm not quite sure why conservatives don't talk about this because the left certainly talks about this. They're very excited about it. They're ecstatic about it. They celebrate it because they know it's how they win forever. So back to the freedom question, it really comes down to freedom as a means to what? And the answer to that question used to be and should be freedom as a means to the end of serving God and serving your family. This was a time before we began to outsource the installation of virtue in our children to the Department of Education. This was a time uh, where it was the role of the family to instill the virtue and morals of the society into the children in order to propagate the culture. And the way to make it as easy as possible for families to do that is to get the government out of their pocket and away from the church. That's the true argument for small government. It's not, well, the Department of Energy is too much government overreach and the free market, could, it doesn't even have to get to that point. The true point is that government costs money. And if you're going to take money away from me and my family, then it better be for something actually necessary. And that's why there's a relationship between our fertility rate and government spending. If people were having more kids, they would not allow the government to take so much of their money for worthless crap. But also perhaps if the government weren't taking so much of their money, they'd be having more children. There's a lot of factors at play here, but that's essentially why I maintain that this fixation on freedom is basically a cope because freedom is only good if you can use it to do good and our government and our culture have made it increasingly difficult to get a well-paying job without amassing tens of thousands of dollars in debt, to find a moral spouse, to buy property, to raise a family, but you're free because what? You can buy a gun and watch porn? That's why your grandfather watched his friends get mauled to death by MG42s in Europe while he was killing Nazis so his grandson could inherit a country that he's taught from a young age to hate because it's evil and racist and also the only way for him to be successful is for him to pursue a university education that will brainwash him and put him tens of thousands if not hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt. But what? It'll at least allow him to get a job. At least it will allow him to become a cog in the wheel for a company that doesn't care about him. But it's okay. Because at least uh, when he gets home, he can play video games and get high. Or maybe he spends his weekends doing that while trying to get lucky with an average at best looking girl on some swipe based dating app. If he's even talking to girls at all, he's got to be careful because one wrong comment at the, at the office towards a woman will get him fired. But does he even care at this point? Does he have any ambition? Does he feel as though he has purpose? Society tells him the reason he's upset isn't because his role in society has been displaced, but rather it's because of toxic masculinity. He should instead just embrace this neo-androgynous culture that we've created in the name of liberalism, or maybe he just kills himself. And then he becomes a statistic cited in a Vox article about how men need to just talk about their feelings more, because when they don't, they commit suicide, which doesn't exactly add up since men have always been held to what they regard as a socially constructed norm to not talk about their feelings. But for some reason, all of a sudden, in the last few decades, uh, they started killing themselves in record numbers. Because it turns out, as a man in America, the only feelings you're allowed to complain about pertain to feelings of defeat over frankly inconsequential things like, oh, I'm depressed because this thing happened or I'm anxious because this thing might happen. But if you dare embrace your masculine drive and say, I'm angry about this thing happening and I'm going to fight against it. Well, no, 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 you can't do that. That's toxic masculinity. Is that the American dream? That's what your grandpa fought for? It's not what my grandpa fought for. Tell you what, I go back to 1942, tell my grandpa what his country would become, how ungrateful the future generations would be, how half the country would hate America, how the culture has embraced evil. It's just another point of view, how utterly emasculated and pacified the men have become. You know what he would have done? Probably go overseas anyways, to be honest. He probably wouldn't have believed me. And that's the thing. No one ever thinks that it can happen to them. Everyone, especially Americans, believe that their country is the natural state of the world. We are truly ignorant to the impermanence of civilizations. Since 1914, there are only eight states left on Earth which have existed and have not had their form of government changed by violence. And these are the United Kingdom, the United States, uh, Sweden, and Switzerland, and then four present or former members of the Commonwealth. And these aren't like scary doomsday prophecies. These are the realities of world history. Civilizations rise and fall. This is nothing new. And no one ever thought that it could happen to them. The United States is more polarized now than at any time since the Civil War. Democrats don't want to be friends with you anymore because you disagree with them politically. 42% of them want to secede from the country, more likely than Republicans. 47% of blacks as well. 
want to secede. Americans say that we're about two thirds of the way to a civil war. Uh, we also know that conservatives understand liberals better than liberals understand conservatives. And that means that we actually know what they believe and why they believe it, but they don't understand the same with us. Oh, and a whole 61% of them think that you are a racist and a sexist because of your politics. 54% of them think that you're ignorant and 21% of them think that you're just evil. That is one in five. One in five Democrats think that you're evil for disagreeing with them. And you know what I say to that? Good. Let them think I'm evil. I don't want to debate these people. I don't want to smile and shake hands and debate the politics of murdering children in the womb. I want to crush them. I want total war. Total war against these people. And if you've got a little alarm going off in your head right now, like, oh, well, wait a minute. Well, that's what the left does. And if we do that, how are we better than them? We're better than them because we're correct. And if you're not sure that you're correct, then perhaps you should take a break from politics and go do your homework to figure out what you actually believe. And this doesn't mean that you can never have your mind changed on something. But if you think that we shouldn't unleash a complete assault on these people because you personally think that perhaps conservatives are wrong about the importance of free speech and the importance of the Second Amendment, and the importance of life in the womb, and the importance of not exposing children to drag queens at taxpayer-funded libraries, if there's not any part of you that's not sure about those, figure it out. Because here's basically what conservatives do. Conservatives watch the left attack them viciously, without pause, in media, in Hollywood, in academia, everywhere. And then the conservative response is to look at that and go, wow, okay, so much for the tolerant left. <laughs> look how immature you guys are being. It's just a political disagreement. I'm much more composed than you are. Really? Is it really just a political disagreement? Is that what we're talking about? Are we talking about Democrats think the federal government should do this, but conservatives want to leave it to the states? No, we're talking about the fundamental uprooting of our country at the hands of these people, the people who hate it. And if you don't believe that they hate it, turn on your television. They just lit your country on fire. And they were supported by every Democrat politician, virtually every institution in this country, except law enforcement, for the most part, most corporations, and almost every media outlet, including those meant for children, such as frickin' Nickelodeon. They have your country by the throat, and you don't want to fight back. You just want to point at them and mock them? Like, like for what, trying? You're like the, you're the kid in the dugout, making fun of the kid on deck who's actually, like, running practice swings. Like, oh, look at him, he's actually trying so hard. Take it easy, buddy. And then the kid smacks it over the fence, and you're just there, probably benched because you suck, pretending that somehow you came out on top do you not want to win well, we're not actually playing baseball or football or whatever it were if like if we lose it's no big deal this is actually a very big deal because if we lose you're gonna get it all you're gonna get socialism you're gonna get hate speech laws you're gonna get guns taken from you but above all else you're gonna get your country taken from you and if i could spearhead this fight if i had the resources and the power i'd be all over it I'm just doing my best right now. But I tweeted this out one time about how every time there's a mass shooting, the left goes on TV and uses it to try and ban guns. And I said, hey, why don't we put the mothers of the young girls who are raped and murdered by illegal immigrants on national television to show people how important border security is? And some conservative replied and said, because we're better than them. And I seriously, I almost got in my car to go find that guy. Like, what do you mean we're better than them? What, you, you think you have principles or something? You don't have principles. You're just telling yourself that because you're too scared or too lazy to fight back. If your principles don't facilitate facilitate success in some capacity, they aren't actually principles. They're just suicide that looks a bit nicer on a bumper sticker. If your principles prevent you from fighting back, then you lose and it's over. This idea of like, well, who gets to decide who's right? Who gets to decide what's good for society? We do. Me and you, big guy. Me and you. You think we don't know right from wrong? Do you think we don't actually know what's good for society? We do actually know. It's why we believe in what we believe. This whole idea of diversity of thought, that's a liberal idea, by the way. Think about it. To suggest that we have to maintain intellectual diversity and represent a broad range of ideas, those are liberal principles. That's diversity and egalitarianism. Those are liberal ideas. And that's not to say the discussion of ideas is bad, but it is to say that maintaining diversity of ideas at all times while refusing to acknowledge or assert your ideas as correct is basically suicide because the left doesn't play like that. They want to crush your ideas. And instead of trying to crush them back, you're just begging to keep a seat at the table. And I'm not, talking about, I'm not talking about outlawing their speech, you know, like they'll do to us when they get into power. I'm just talking about fighting them as hard as they're fighting us. Fire with fire. Because clearly what you're doing now isn't working. They just burned your house down and you're out on the front lawn talking about, whoa, take it easy, bud. No need to be immature. But they already convinced the whole neighborhood that you're a racist and a sexist bastard. So no one even gives a damn. Total war. It's the only way that we win. And if you doubt that, at least consider the possibility that they want you to doubt that because it's how they've gained so much ground in the last 70 years. And the reason they're willing to fight stems back to the hierarchy. They view societal hierarchy as an unjust hierarchy of power. Therefore, it is to be destroyed by any means necessary, whereas we basically view it uh, as a hierarchy of competence. And we feel as though we don't really have to fight to preserve it because it'll preserve itself because nature cannot be conquered. Maybe. But you know what can be conquered? 
us, we can, we can be conquered. We can have our rights taken. So as it would turn out, if you have values, you actually have to fight to preserve and maintain them. But we failed to do that. The whole idea of American conservatism was that we don't have to be unified by ethnicity or by race or by religion because we're united by our values. But then we went ahead and failed to actually conserve those values or fight for those values because of our principles or whatever. And now we're basically a country of 330 million people with no centralized identity or belief system. We have no trust in any of our institutions. And then you look outside and everything's burning. And this is surprising to you. You are shocked by this? I wasn't. This is such an obvious, inevitable symptom of the society that is committing suicide. That's really all I could think. Like, wow, really a shame, isn't it? And the riots might come under control, but riots aren't the problem. They're just a symptom of the problem. And the media, half the country, all the Democrats, all the mega corporations, they didn't take our side. They stood against us and against America. Because while George Floyd's death, which was obviously wrong, as we've talked about, is what sparked this, it really is just the straw that broke the camel's back for the proportion of the population that hates America and everything for which it stands. And that's really what's disappointing about this. Because it's not like they're breaking up with us or they're separating themselves. It's they have the support of the culture, the elites, the institutions. We're the ones in the way. We're the dissenting voice. The narrative is that America is bad. It's evil. And if you disagree, it's because you're evil too. What we are witnessing is the real-time dissolving of our society. The media and the elites are fueling the fire because they profit off division, both in power and in wealth. And half of our fellow Americans are cheering while they do it. You ever think about that? You ever think about why they do that? Why the media only covers certain things? Why they don't cover when a black man murders an elderly white couple? or when dozens of black men kill other black men every day in this country, or when a black man, or the fact that black men are much more likely to kill white men uh, than vice versa. Do you ever wonder why they don't cover that? And that's not to say that we should flip it, like, oh, let's make everyone hate black people instead of hating white people since they kill more people. This is to say that we have to recognize that the media and the elites want us divided, especially under a president like Donald Trump. And the reason for that is that the elites are people who send American jobs overseas to line their own pockets. They are people who profit off getting the population addicted to drugs and pornography. They are people who profit off you hating your neighbor, convincing you to do that. These are people who need you distracted in order to maintain their power over you, both in government and in society. Why do you think their slogan is diversity is our strength? Why do you think they promote diversity? There's nothing inherently good about diversity, like whatever. But we're taught from infancy that it's our greatest strength. And we're also taught from infancy that the biggest problem in America is racism. And that racism, by the way, can only come from white people. And so you've got generations of minorities that grow up and they believe that racist white people are the reason for the problems facing their community. I'm not quite sure why the Hispanics get to talk about American racism and oppression, but perhaps I'm just not woke enough. And so truly, the only strength that diversity actually brings is that it allows for the elites to maintain a strong grasp over the population. It allows them to pit us against each other so as not to have us unite against them. And that's why they have to do this under Trump, who ran an anti-establishment, anti-elite, pro-American people, America first campaign. If they can distract the population from that, and if they can convince them that this is all Trump's fault, that message will cease to resonate. It will be dismissed. That's why they love mass immigration. They bring in people from the third world. The elites hire them instead of American workers to save money. The country becomes more divided because they use their media to preach division and racism, and then that divided country requires a bigger government to keep from collapsing at the expense of you, the American people. And I don't think these riots were Antifa. I was there. I saw who was there. Uh, but I do think that Antifa and other white leftists who hate our country will go to events like this and basically try to escalate things because they want to create as much chaos as possible because many of them are accelerationists, which means that they believe the only way to achieve their Marxist utopia is for America to completely implode and collapse so they can start from scratch. And so the left once again uses minorities as a weapon to enact the changes that they want to see in society. They don't actually care about them. They're not sitting down and explaining Marx or Kropotkin to them. They're just exploiting the anger and resentment that minorities have towards this country from decades of cultural conditioning to benefit themselves. Donald Trump needs to take action, not just tweet, but actually like go after these people and prosecute them because they're terrorists. And that's the thing. We care about this, but they don't. We just want to come together under one flag and be friends. They don't. No, they want to crush us. So maybe it's time for us to like finally decide that we're done being crushed. My own cousin, with whom I was very close, unfollowed me on Instagram because I didn't post a black square to help end racism the other day. And it's not that she's a bad person. It's just that the ideology is so pervasive in our society because of how much we fail to stop it from becoming so. And as the family structure collapses, people seek to find identity elsewhere, such as an ideology. You will never get away from identity politics in a multi-ethnic society with no family structure, especially when half of the country has realized how effective it is for consolidating power. Like, do you actually think we could fight off China right now? They're laughing at us. That's why the CNN skit that I did was so important, because sure, it was funny, but it was also true. If we were invaded by the Chinese right now, I'd bet that our media would not take our side, because at this point, they are more aligned with the interests of the Chinese than they are with our interests. So how do we come back from this? What's the solution to this? Well, in theory, it's simple, but it's much harder in practice. Basically, it is this. 
we are abandoning neoconservatism because it has failed. And perhaps the reason that it's failed is because it was never actually conservatism. You can look into the history of it. It's literally just liberals who thought that we should be the world's police and who didn't support progressivism, aka the logical conclusion of liberalism. It's like I've been saying this whole video. The reason conservatives lose is because we're not electing conservatives. We are electing liberals, but we're done with that. We're going to let neoconservatism die in the fires of Minneapolis and Dallas and Washington, D.C. And we're going to have an authentic conservative movement in this country, one that's already underway as of the election of Donald Trump and one that's already been derailed to an extent by the Republican establishment, but it doesn't matter because we are only getting started. The future of American conservatism is nationalism. It is putting America first and putting the American family first, whether that family is white, black, doesn't matter. We're not going to sell out our families for other countries anymore. And we're returning to social conservatism because we're done pretending that drag queen story hour and unlimited abortion access is what the founding fathers meant by liberty. And we're going to protect our workers with trade and immigration policies that put the American worker first because we're done pretending that free trade is anything more than the science of bankrupting our country in the most efficient way possible. And because we know that America America first trade policy is what the founding fathers did and it's what every nation that's ever become wealthy in the history of the world has done and we're done bankrupting ourselves while watching nations like China become increasingly wealthy and hostile towards us and most importantly we're done losing we're done sitting by watching the destruction of our country pretending that being a pussy is some kind of virtue this country people on the left and right are hungry for an authentic conservative movement that they can sink their teeth into and that's what we're going to give to them and if the Washington establishment doesn't agree, that's fine, because we're going to crush them. They had their chance, and they failed. I am 20 years old. This will be my life's work. I'm not going anywhere anytime soon. There are plans at work that stretch 10, 20, 30 years down the road, not just with me, but with people I know personally. They tell me things. There is reason to be optimistic. The best thing that you can do is to mentally prepare yourself for the fight that we're in for our country and support the cause in any way that you can. The people who are alive right now are going to decide the fate of our country, and it's our job to make sure that we leave something for our grandchildren to be proud of and that we teach them to be proud of it, not to hate it. But in the meantime, while things are crazy, make peace with God and get a gun, because for now, you are on your own. Hey guys, thanks for sticking around to the end of the video. That was a long one. Uh, a lot of concepts there, a lot of different topics covered. Probably should have maybe dedicated a bit more time to each one, but this was sort of a free-form rant. So if you want to talk about those different concepts, I'm actually adding something to the website that's basically a Zoom lottery. So every month for a couple hours, I'm going to do a Zoom call with like 10 random members, uh, and we can talk about whatever you want, politics, news, culture, and you also can support the channel. So if you want to support the channel, you want to talk about literally anything with me and some other guys, just a bunch of bros talk about politics, whatever, uh, go to heckoffcomedy.com com slash membership that's how you keep this stuff going and that's how we we win the war basically so i'd appreciate that but thank you so much for watching and may god bless you and your family and america